you could pray for us at the end and then I'll come back up. Would that be alright? I'll share some of this stuff. Cheers, mate. Cool. Um, it's really nice to, to be with you uh, here. I've, I've been to speak a couple of times, but I've never been, uh, joined you on a Sunday morning, and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, this week, um, I read a story that I reckon would make uh, a brilliant film. This is completely true. About 500 years ago, uh, there was this uh, boy in London uh, who was called, well, he had quite a strange name, actually, Lambert Simnel. Uh, if you've uh, got to choose a, a baby name coming up, maybe that's one to go for, Lambert Simnel. And Lambert Simnel uh, was the son of a baker. Um, anyway, this, this little kid got pulled inside into, uh, it wasn't exactly a gang, but a group of influential men who hated the new king, uh, Henry VII. Henry VII, he was a Welsh man, he'd just become king, they did not like him at all. And so this group of people got this little kid into their group and hatched a plan. And they said to this little kid, OK, what we want you to do is we want you to pretend to be somebody else. And they turned to the kid and said, we want you to pretend that you are the Duke of Warwick. Now the real Duke of Warwick at the time was locked up uh, in, in prison in the Tower of London. But they said to, to this boy, Lambert Simmel, we want you to be the Duke of Warwick. And they hatched this plan. So you can imagine it, can't you? Who are you? Lambert Simmel. No. Who are you? La- no. The Duke of Warwick. Who are you? The Duke of Warwick. Right, we're ready to go. And what they then did is they took this kid and they managed, they took him to Dublin and they managed to persuade everybody that this kid really was the Duke of Warwick. That he'd escaped from the Tower of London, that he was the rightful heir to the throne. And Ireland at that point was included uh, in, uh, in in the United Kingdom. And so these people in Ireland were completely duped. Uh, you can read accounts of this boy. Uh, who they you know, put a crown on his head. Apparently uh, they put him on uh, their shoulders and walked him to the palace. And in fact the whole of Ireland was convinced that this boy really was the Duke of Warwick. And so he really was the right king. Now eventually the story would turn a bit sour. They, uh, they thought, right, now we've managed to persuade the, Ireland, the whole the people of Ireland that this guy is the true king. Maybe we can have a go at England as well. So what happened is they uh, landed just north of here actually, uh, in Lancashire. Uh, the people of Lancashire were not so easily persuaded. They sent a message down to London, uh, who uh, uh, they then came up with armies. And uh, the boy Lambert Simnel was proven not to be the king. Uh, and all of the conspirators... Uh, were sent to prison in the Tower of London. Incredible story though, isn't it? That this just boy off the streets of London could pretend to be the king. He was a pretender to the throne. And, and today's story, we're going to see someone who is a pretender to the throne. Not a pretender to the throne of Ireland, not a pretender to the throne of England, but who set himself up against Jesus as a pretender to the throne of his life. And that man's name, the name of the pretender to the throne was Herod. Um, If you've got your Bible, look back down uh, to page 1106 and we're going to see a little bit more about this guy Herod. This isn't the first time if you've uh, uh, read a little bit of uh, the Bible for yourself, this won't be the first time that you've come across Herod. In fact, the Herod family were an important family. You might remember that there was a guy called Herod at the time of Jesus. Do you remember that at his birth? And a guy called Herod put all of the baby boys to death because he felt threatened about the news of a new king of the Jews. Well, the Herod that we read about here was the grandson of that Herod who'd massacred all of those babies. And last week, if you were here, you would have seen something of Herod Jr. in action. He's a chip off the old book. He's just like his granddad's. And he too is opposing and threatening the church in Judea. Uh, If you look at uh, just the verses at the beginning of chapter 12, uh, on the the left-hand column, uh, I'll just read the first four verses there. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to uh, seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison. 
handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So here's this guy, Herod Jr., and he is hell-bent on seeking to annihilate the church. And these verses that we read just now form the backdrop to what you will have seen last week if you were here. The miraculous rescue of Peter from prison. Do you remember an angel is sent? He strikes Peter, his chains fall off, and he's able to walk out free. And so despite King Herod's best attempts to quash the church, the Saviour Jesus saves Peter. I guess if you're going to score the chapter so far, you might score it this way. Jesus, the one true God of the universe, won Herod nil. And now we come into the second half of the story. Today's account, back in verse 19, uh, Herod is in Caesarea, that word we've got to, to know so well now. He's 54 years old, it's 44 AD, and as Herod opened his diary for the day, verse 20 shows us what his agenda was. He had been quarrelling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. So here's the agenda of the day. He's got to meet some politicians. It's politicians from Tyre and Sidon. These towns aren't actually part of Herod's kingdom, but they were near neighbours. And they relied on Herod in order to get food. It was Herod's country where all the food was grown, and they could offer Herod some other things. And so they desperately meet with him. If they've got this argument with Herod, they can't trade with him, and so they can't have food. So what do they do? Uh, Look down, having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they ask for peace. Uh, It's another great name, isn't it? If you've got to give the kids names, why not give them Blastus? I think that could be, you know, a very cool one. Anyway, this guy Blastus, he's a little bit like Nick or Margaret, uh, if Herod is Sir Sir Alan. Uh, They know that if they've got the ear of Blastus, they've got the ear of the king. And so these politicians very sensibly go to Blastus and say, we need to speak with Herod. And with Blastus in the corner, the meeting with Herod soon takes place. Well, verse 21 describes the day of the meeting. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. On the day of the meeting, Herod puts on his very best royal garb and sits on a throne in an amphitheatre where everyone can see him. Now interestingly, a Jewish historian at the time uh, wrote a, a record of this very account and describes Herod's clothes. Listen to this. Uh, on the second day of the spectacle, King Herod put on a garment made wholly of silver of a truly wonderful texture and came into the amphitheatre early in the morning. There, the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays, shone out in a wonderful manner and was so resplendent as to spread awe over all those who looked intently upon him. Herod is very impressive. You can imagine Herod, can't you? I am looking good. Herod has got all his bling on and he is turning the heads of everyone that is in the amphitheatre. All the eyes of the politicians, all the eyes of the others in the amphitheatre are on Herod and his impressive, shiny clothes. I imagine Herod looking a bit like one of those sort of cheesy 80s game show hosts with a sparkly top on. There he is. And everyone is looking at him. You know when you have those clothes, I remember this, especially growing up, when you've got trainers before everybody else in your class at school, and you just kind of walked in with a swagger, look at me, I am cool. That is Herod. And Herod enjoyed being the centre of attention very much. Well, let's look at what uh, Herod does. He sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not of a man. So Herod uh, clears his throat, stands up, microphone's there, and he gives this speech, and evidently it was favourable to the politicians from Tyre and Sidon. Given how they respond, Herod is enjoying being the centre of attention. 
And his speech is there so that people are saying, Herod, you are great. Herod, he's the main man, isn't he? And he no doubt is enjoying being the centre of attention. And as you finish speaking, you can imagine the crowd in that amphitheatre looking at this shiny man and erupting into rapturous applause. You can imagine it, can't you? Herod, Herod, Herod. Even more than that, another chant starts. Look at verse 22 again. This is the voice of a God, not of a man. And do you see, the whole setup has been stage managed by Herod to make him look good. The whole setup has been framed by Herod for his glory and for his reputation. Everything is there to make Herod look good. The shiny clothing is there to make Herod look good. The mercy that he chose to show the people of Tyre and Sidon was there to make Herod look good. His presence sat on the throne looking down over everyone in the amphitheatre was there to make Herod look good. Maybe it was one of these things. Maybe it was all of them that caused the people to cry out, this is more than a man. This is a divine being. This is a God. And to Herod... That was music to his ears. This is a divine being. This is a God. Can you imagine how Herod's heart swelled with pride at that moment? Now what the people did was wrong. The Bible tells us that to give the glory and attention and praise to anything other than the God of the universe is wrong. What the people did was wrong, but here's the thing. How Herod reacted was far, far worse. Everything that Herod had, had come from God. Herod's job, his authority as king, had come from God. His ability to speak had come from God. Even his shiny silver top had come from God. But instead of giving God glory... Herod receives the people's praise as if it was true. Just think what Herod should have done. He should have said, guys, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but you've got it all wrong here. He should have stopped them. He should have rebuked them. He should have rejected their praise and said, I am a mere man. All of this comes from God. But instead, Herod owns the people's glory and embraces their praise and in fact says, Give me some more. Bring it on. I think this is even more unacceptable when we understand Herod's background. After all, he just heard about Peter's miraculous deliverance from prison. And he should have just thought, well, something supernatural is going on here. There is one bigger than me. And although Herod was, uh, had been brought up in Rome, he was Jewish. He would have been familiar with the Ten Commandments. And do you remember the first of the Ten Commandments where the Lord God of the universe, the Creator says, you shall have no gods before me. Herod should have known better. And yet here we see the heart of a man that has set itself up against the God of the universe for a fight. First in persecuting and opposing God's own people and the advance of the good news about Jesus. And now through further hardening his heart so that his own profile could be furthered. Now we might not be kings like Herod. We might not even own shiny silver clothes like Herod. But actually the Bible teaches us that our situation is not that different from Herod's. Because if like Herod, we spurn the Lord God, we say to him, no, I'm not living for you, It's never going to be very long before, like Herod, we place upon ourselves the obsession that actually we should only have with him. Here's the point. If God isn't at the centre of our universe, then we will soon place ourselves at the centre of our universe. And then all of our actions are driven in an obsessive way to present ourselves 
before others in a certain way to act for our own glory. And I think this shows itself in a whole number of very subtle ways. Even yesterday, um, I was saying to Steve, what clothing should I wear uh, as I come to, to preach? And, and that's because, secretly, sometimes I think, well, actually, I want to make the best impression with people that I've not met before. Sometimes we lie awake, don't we, obsessed with what people are saying about us behind our backs. Sometimes we manipulate conversations. It's not maybe that we tell lies, but we don't tell the whole truth because we want to make ourselves look funny or cool or wise. And our relationships become a, become a, a, become a kind of game of hide and seek where I only want to show the good things about myself to other people. And I will hide away those things that I think people might not like. I'm sometimes terrified that the truth about me might emerge. And here's the thing, even when we're disgusted or appalled with ourselves, very often that's a form of being self-obsessed as well. I'm obsessed with myself, not the Lord God, because I depend on the opinions of others and I work obsessively for my own glory. And my eyes are constantly upon myself just like Herod's were. I hope you can see how ugly this is. I hope you can see how it becomes a form of slavery as well. Where I'm completely dependent all the time on what other people think. And it prevents me from acting in ways where sometimes I know that I should. I think at first, doesn't he, Herod looks like a really strong man there in his shiny clothes on his throne in the amphitheater. He looks like a strong man. But just stop and think about it. Actually, Herod was a very weak man. He depended upon the opinions of others to give him glory and value and reputation. And he was a weak man because it destroyed his relationships with other people. We see him being really manipulative. He beats other people down in order that he can make himself look good. And very often we do the same. The very people whose opinions we crave, we will sometimes knock down in order to make ourselves look better compared to them. It's ugly, isn't it? And that's what we see a little picture of in Herod. Well, if we read on in the account, we see the resulting effect of being self-obsessed and living for your own glory. Look down at verse 23, because we see, back in the amphitheatre, Herod is saying, bring on your praise. Look at verse 23, what happens? Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Well, Herod is struck by this angel with intestinal worms and died. Um, I've been doing some internet research about this, uh, and you can uh, find out from doctors what actually happened to Herod. Uh, if you're a little bit squeamish, you might want to cover your ears. Uh, Herod's death was caused by an unusual infestation of a tropical tapeworm. Okay? The worm lives in the liver, first of all, and then the bowels, and then keeps replicating and replicating and replicating and replicating until the whole body is infected with this nasty worm. And so within a short time, Herod was dead, literally eaten from the inside out. Dying in humiliation and in just about as much pain as is humanly possible. I mean, it's, it's horrible, isn't it? Just to stop and think about it. And why is it that Luke, the writer of Acts, tells us this? I think it's not to gross us out, but rather to fill us in. The purpose of the whole account here is to teach us about the absolute necessity about giving the Creator God, Jesus, the glory that belongs to Him alone, and the absolute control that He has, even over people who prefer their own glory. And so here's the thing. This account of Herod is a graphic picture of the fate of all those people who reject God and instead prefer to live with themselves, who are obsessed with themselves, and live with themselves at the centre of the universe. 
And this account is not saying, well, all people who are self-obsessed will die of worm infestation. Of course it's not saying that. It's a picture. And what it is saying is, ultimately you will die in humiliation and face Jesus' judgment on your life. Like Herod, the life of someone who is self-obsessed will be brief and noisy and quickly over. I'm sure that Herod had a great funeral. I'm sure that there was great music. I'm sure that people lined up one after another to say how wonderful Herod was. To say their funny stories of Herod's greatness. But that is nothing compared to the eternity of judgment that Herod faced as someone who refused to give Jesus the glory that he deserves. Now, I don't know about you, but even as we were driving down this morning, I was thinking, well, what is God's problem? What is Jesus' problem? Demanding that people give glory to him. Is it like he's on some form of ego trip? Is he like the kid who kind of kicks up a fuss when he's not being given enough attention? Well, no, I don't think so. Because we've already seen, haven't we, when Herod sets himself up as a god, when Herod says, put me at the centre of your world, what that is, is an ugly thing. Imagine if, I'm not going to do this, but imagine if I said, okay folks, um, I want you for the rest of your life to put me at the centre of your lives. I want you to worship me, and whenever you've got an important decision, I want you to come to me, and I will tell you what I think you should do based on what will make me look best. I mean, that would be ugly, wouldn't it? It would be ugly because it's untrue. I'm asking you to put me in a place where I don't belong. I'm playing fast and loose with reality. Because the reality is I'm not at the centre of your life. But equally the reality is that God is at the centre of your life. Everything that you have is from him. And so when we see here the Lord God demanding worship alone, it's as if he's saying, look, Wake up and smell the coffee. Stop the fantasy. Face reality. Stop putting yourself at the centre of my universe. Because that is a fantasy that will end up in disaster. You will ruin yourself. And you will ruin other people. And so what this account shows is that God will act in judgment. He will not let people set themselves up as God's against him forever. And the way in which we, the, the force of this passage comes is it contrasts what happened to Peter as he was struck by an angel and Herod as he was struck by an angel. The same word struck is used uh, to describe what the angel did in verse 23 and in verse 7 as well. Both Herod and Peter were struck by an angel. Maybe it was even the same angel that did the striking. But that's where the similarities end. In Peter's case, he's struck by an angel and he receives release from certain death. In Herod's case, he's struck by an angel and yet he's brought the fate of certain death. Peter, well, he faced momentary troubles but he was obsessed with the glory of Jesus and he reached eternal life. Herod, well, he'd received momentary praise and adulation but he refused to give Jesus the glory he deserved. He preferred self-obsession and he reaped eternal death. Now just before we wrap up, look at the effect of God's judgment. Uh, Verses 24 and 25. What effect did God's judgment of Herod have? But the word of God continued to increase and spread. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. What effect did God's judgment of Herod have? Well, Herod's death in itself proved Jesus to be Lord. And it proved Christianity to be true. The way that Herod died could have given nobody that was watching any doubt that this was anything other than the hand of God. And should have led to nothing else than a new fear of the Lord. A thing that says, I am not God. Jesus is God. 
But notice as well, with Herod out of the way, the church could continue its work of spreading the gospel without fear of persecution, at least in the short term. Verse 25 says, with Herod dead, the way is made open for Paul and Barnabas to return to Antioch, their home church, in safety. And the Lord Jesus is preparing the way for the first missionary journey, which you'll see more of when the action continues uh, in chapter 13. But what's the headline? It's this. Neither Herod nor the forces of hell could thwart the Lord Jesus from honouring his word and saving those whom he had chosen. And so let's just draw a distinction between those verses at the beginning of the chapter that we read and now at the end of the chapter. At the beginning of the chapter, it looks like Herod is in charge. In fact, when Luke talks about Herod at the beginning, he gives him his full title, King Herod. He's on the rampage. He's arresting and persecuting the leaders of the Christian church. He's obsessed with himself. He's obsessed with his own glory. And at the end of the chapter, Herod, no more referred to as King Herod, just Herod, is struck down and dead. The chapter opens with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphing. It closes with Herod dead, Peter free, and the word of God triumphing. And the Lord Jesus has given us a clear picture of the ultimate and eternal fate of both those who oppose him, but also those who have turned from themselves to show allegiance to King Jesus above all. The Lord Jesus promised on many occasions that he will one day return and wrong all rights. And that day is coming. And we're closer to it now than when we started this meeting. When Jesus returns, finally, the world will be put right and God's kingdom will be established. And pretenders to the throne like Herod will finally be forced to bow the knee to King Jesus. But the amazing news of the gospel which you read about in the Bible, is that those who humble themselves, who will lift their eyes away from themselves and to King Jesus, can be forgiven and be part of his kingdom forever. We've seen that Herod was struck for his disobedience. One of the ways in which Jesus described his death on the cross, you can read about it in Mark's Gospel, is he said, I will be struck. At the cross, Jesus takes upon himself the full effects of the punishment of our sin, including our self-obsession. So that all who will look away from themselves and to King Jesus might be forgiven. And so I just want to ask you this morning, who are you in this story? Are you Peter? Are you Herod? And if until this morning you've been more obsessed with yourself than with Jesus, the one true God, will you come clean this morning? Will you admit that you've lived at the centre of your universe? Will you admit that you've ignored the true king? Do you see how that messes with reality? Do you see how that hurts you and it hurts others? Well, if you will bite the bullet and humble yourself and that if you'll admit to the Lord Jesus that you have nothing to commend yourself to him, he will accept you this morning as the one who was struck on our behalf. It would be an amazing thing if you arrived here this morning an enemy of the Lord Jesus that go home reconciled to him because you have turned back to him and trust is striking for you. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we admit that so often we are obsessed with ourselves. And this morning we want to reaffirm our desire to say, Lord, that we want to be obsessed with you, the creator and redeemer and not obsessed with ourselves. And Lord, I pray please that for each of us here this morning, you'd help us to see more of what it means to
to live out the reality that you are at the centre of the universe. Lord, thank you that although we've spent our whole life telling you that we don't want you at the centre of the universe, you still make a way possible for us to be brought into your kingdom forever. We thank you for what that says about how wonderful you are and the kind of God that you are. A God who is better than our, even the best of our imaginations. Amen.